Good morning, good afternoon, good evening for people of different parts of the world. Uh, I hope um, this talk finds you well, and we have the special honor today to have Bachman joining us for our weekly culture storytelling. Our culture storytelling use stories to tell travel, history, food, music, inspiring people, um, different formats and aspects of culture. Today, our special guest has a varied, very varied background. He was born and grew up in Iran, but lives in Melbourne, Australia. So it's almost midnight for him at the moment. He has an engineering background, but also a professional in cultural experience design. We have the pleasure to invite Bahan to give us a talk about the ancient engineering behind Persian Empire. Bahan, I am going to spotlight you so you can introduce yourself to say hello to us. Uh, good morning, good Afternoon and good evening, everyone. My name is Bahman. Uh, I am an Iranian engineer and tour guide living in Melbourne. And I'm going to share next 45 minutes to hour with you, sharing some engineers from engineering uh, knowledge about ancient Persia. So it will be a whole lot of people. Uh, I probably cannot uh, answer all the questions or comments. Uh, Please, until I load the first slide, uh, if you have any engineer, uh, please type in a chat box so I can have a look if I see any colleague or not. <laughs> uh, uh, before I start the tour, let me share the map of Iran with you because today I'm gonna take you all around the country. So uh, you might get confused where in the country you are seeing. I try to share with you as much as I can, but it's a limited time. So I will start these engineering lives of ancient Persia from the very southwest part of the country. It is the most ancient part and it, the most mysterious part in few different aspects, including engineering. So you can see the map of Iran. Uh, I will start what I want to share with you from here, from the very southwest, you might have heard of Babylon, which actually used to be in Mesopotamia, southern part of Mesopotamia. And I want to share some uh, interesting thing from a secret uh, civilization right next to them, the Elamites. After that, uh, we will get out of the ancient time I will take you around central part of the country and will share some of the traditional way of engineering that still in practice nowadays. After that part, we will get back to the ancient time again. So that was a little bit about what we're gonna cover today. Uh, so here is the start. And after that, we'll go to the center and we will end up in the South. Hope you like the uh, live today. Uh, if you're an engineer, don't expect me about talking about the modern engineering. It's all about the ancient time. It's all about the play of the four elements, water, fire, wind, and the earth. So we know that more than 100 elements nowadays, forget about them, it's only four. So let's uh, start the live from Chogazambil in Khuzestan. So what you can see here in the screen is a ziggurat. So usually people know ziggurats uh, of Babylon. You will be surprised what these best preserved ziggurats of the world do here in Iran. But it's more into that. It's like ziggurats wasn't only a Babylonian thing. People in Southwestern Iran, in Khuzestan, they used to build this kind of formations as well, like the ancient ziggurats. The building that you can see right in front of yourselves, it's from 3,200 years ago. Uh, 
it's a bit of mystery. Elamites are kind of people that we don't have that much of knowledge about them. Uh, 100 years after finishing of these ziggurats, another civilization, Assyrians, stormed to them and they make a great massacre of them. This is something that remained from their time. And I should say, Elamites started a civilization 6,000 years ago. So what you can see is after three thousands of them to make uh, lots of great things. So what has remained from Elamites in terms of the ag agriculture and the mythology is amazing. So they were very well aware of how to make the alloys and how to make like a two alloys on the same structure. So some of the uh, metallurgy techniques that they used to do on those ancient times is comparable to, with what we do today. And even nowadays, we have no idea they used to make those things. So I start uh, my video, my uh, tour after showing you the Chogazambil with a short video about Elamite uh, civilization and the great thing that has left from them. And after that, we'll take you to central Iran and we'll share how people makes the land of Iran livable with for themselves with the engineering techniques. So again, if you have any engineers, please type in the chat box. I'd like to know my colleagues better. Uh, let me share this video with you. And after that, we will uh, start touring central Iran and I will put that technical glass and explain you the places from engineering point of view.
after this uh, start to the very uh, ancient uh, and secretive part of uh, ancient Iran, it's time to start our tour of uh, engineering or our life of engineering. <laughs> so how many engineers we have, Minji? Uh, is there any? Yeah, um, so we got greetings from different people uh, from Boston, US, um, PA, US, Berkshire, UK, New Jersey, US, from Vietnam. Uh, I haven't seen anybody typing he or she has engineering background. So if you have engineering background, don't be shy, type in the chat box so you can make a kind of professional connection with Bachman. Okay, maybe we can design something traditional or based on traditional okay. engineering together. I'm just uh, kidding. So from uh, the ancient land of Elamites, I want to take you to central Iran, to a state of Isfahan and Yazd. So usually as much as we go, oh, we have one. Gary we have from Gary. Florida. <laughs> so, three, three quarters of engineering background, Gary. <laughs> so... Usually as much as you get to the central and eastern Iran, the climate becomes very dry and the environment became very challenging. So because of this challenging environment from one side and Iran being on the Silk Road, so a great location for doing trade from the other side, people you had to make their brains how to survive in those environments. So because of that, we have some kinds of really interesting uh, engineering in terms of architecture and irrigation in Iran, different aspects, which is uh, really interesting. And it's also something that I want to start my tour, my, my life from that today. But the first thing that I want to start my uh, talk about is the traditional Iranian air conditioning. So awesome. I want to talk about wind catches. You know, I said that it's desert. Sometimes the temperature get up to 45 degrees. Some areas 50 degrees over the summertime. How you want to live on those places. And you don't have any water, anything. So I want to share with you how Iranian used to cool down their houses. So I start from a really fancy place, like in, like a governor house of place of living. What you can see is a wind catcher. So here is a garden in the driest part of the country. The rainfall here is pretty much nothing. So what people did uh, the, before they built a wind catcher to build a garden, they had to transfer the water. So that was one of the secrets in the ancient time. Uh, people uh, like in Babylon and in Syria, they used to have big rivers. And they were always surprised how people inside Iran living. They didn't know about the secrets of Iranian until in one of the wars, they could have got into Iran and they will share that uh, secret in the inscription from around 3000 years ago. So the answer of this secret was the traditional Ghanas. So Ghanas are the underground water channels that they transfer the water from the underground uh, uh, like this level of the airs the way we are having and because there is no sun there is no evaporation and we can transfer the water to the really really long distances so inside Persia we were lucky that we have mountains so because of the mountains we had water but the good places to live sometimes were far from the mountains because of that, uh, at least from 3,000 years ago, people managed to dig the, the really long channels under the ground to transfer the water. So, for example, to make this garden, uh, the water has been transferred to here from 70 kilometers away. 
Uh, I will get back to canals again. It's a really great engineering topic, how they manage to make all those underground water channels. But when we have water here, we can make a garden and we can use the water for cooling down, but we need to be very calculative of how much we use the water. So these towers, they can catch the wind from every single direction. You can see that uh, they are 360 degrees. So when they're catching the wind, they channelize the wind through a tunnel right under these uh, towers. And that tunnel uh, get narrower and narrower. So if you have any fluid uh, like, fluid dynamic engineer here or any person who know about fluid dynamics, when the tunnel get narrower, one of the consequences will be that the pressure of the air will increase. So the air get pressurized without using an engine or anything like that. So when the air get pressurized uh, from right under the tunnel, the pressurized air will get hit to, yeah, will get hit to these water pools. In Persian, we call them holes. So what people used to do, they used to fill these pools. And when the pressurized heat, wind got hit to this pool, the air would have been cooled down. And guess what? The water consumption was very minimal. So we didn't need to uh, use that much water to cool down the whole house. So the pressurized air that get cooled down uh, used to flow all around the houses and cool down the house. But it's not as easy as this. Like uh, the tower that I showed you is 18 meters high. And it is right on the ceiling. So the tower is pretty heavy. So it won't be easy to make a roof that can carry such a tower. So if you have a look, you can see that the ceiling is a round shape. And again, when we have a round formation, uh, the circle and round formation can uh, scatter the pressure. So if we have the roof flat, it was really hard to manage the load of the wind catcher. But well, we make is like a round, like a dome kind of form. It will spread the weight of the tower evenly all around the ceiling. And because of that, we can make such a tower on top of this building. So pretty amazing way of thinking about managing and making the balance of all the different elements to have the best uh, performance of uh, water, electricity, and have a really comfortable building. Uh, this is uh, just one example. And here is actually the technical thinking were about making the balance between three of the main elements, water, wind, and the earth. No, it, the pressured air gets hit to the cool water and it's already pressured. It's the air that gets collected from the higher in the earth. And when it gets cooled by the water, it starts flowing all around the house. So the water is in the pool. Yeah. So when I explain this at this point, I want to get back to canats. So canats are a pretty uh, like interesting phenomenon. Uh, it's been an invention, like the last talk of Canos has been in Assyrian and Babylonian uh, documents uh, in more than 3,000 years ago th that they mentioned of Canos. Uh, later in the history, in uh, post-Islamic time, uh, Arabs, they took the technology of can Canos with themselves uh, to North Africa and to Spain. So nowadays, especially in Morocco, uh, we can see some examples of canots as well. So I will share another short video about canots, but uh, 
I mentioned that we have canals that can be up to 80 to 200 kilometers away. So usually they start canals from a place that they found the water in the mountains. They dig an initial well to make sure that you, they, they can find the fire canals. And after that, they go to their starting point that they want to transfer the water through. And they start digging the main can, uh, channel to the original well. So on the way they dig some wells as well, you can see how the uh, whole thing will be in the video that I showed you. But it's a very tricky job. Imagine that uh, the water to be flow, we need to have some steepness, but if it will be too steep, the water will wash away the whole thing. And to give you a bit of uh, idea, we have canals that functioning from more than 2000 years ago. So it's, it was like the really, really uh, accurate calculation, how you make the channel, when you start the channel, to get to the point that you have water and you make the first well, and how to make it dry to have the first rot stick. So this is all done by human all around the time. And the estimation is the total number of the canal canals around Iran, uh, the lens on total it is equal to the uh, distance of the earth to the moon so it's been like massive uh, jobs all around the country and also to give you a little bit of other information to dig one kilometer of uh, canots you need to uh, spend a year so let's say when you have canots from 100 kilometer away it's like a hundred year old job so people were doing this work for 100 years like people taking over the job and they shouldn't forget any details. So let me share this uh, video with you about Canot. And after that, we will continue some of the other interesting engineering highlights. It was a short video to give you some understanding. Yes, so if, if, you, if you sum up the total number of the canals that we have in Peja, it will be the distance from the Earth to the Moon. It's wow. like huge, huge network of underground water channels. And wow. that's how people make Peja livable. Incredible. So, after getting out of the story of the canals and how people could have uh, make water, uh, I want to go further in that point of uh, like nowadays, still lots of the canals are functioning uh, and uh, in certain areas, people still use canals. Actually the most sustainable way to irrigate the places. But what about if we want to store the water? So the next thing that I want to show it to you, an example of the traditional water reservoirs. It's in a dry places. So from time to time, we might have some rainfall in certain areas, or we have like canals might have the water in certain time of the year. And let's say in the summer, we might not have water in a place like Iran. And we need to uh, store the water for the time that uh, we don't have enough water. So this is structure that you can see, it is just a tiny part of a traditional water reservoir. The main part of this thing is under the ground. So we're going to go down, I'm going to take you down under the ground to show how this water reservoir is. Uh, before I take you down, I want you to notice, I'm going to get back to you and ask some questions. Uh, you can see there are some uh, wind catchers here on top of these uh, 
water reservoir, but we don't have anyone living in a water reservoir. So why we have wind catches here? Let me take you inside this. Let's go down. So sometimes in these water reservoirs, we can uh, store whole lots of water. For this reason, usually these water reservoirs, like the main structure is under the ground. Because if you store the water, that will be heavy. So the whole thing must be under the ground. So that's the easiest way. Like we don't need to make anything as strong to hold the water. Here is the water reservoir from uh, those times. So this water reservoir is not functional. We can see the whole area that water used to be stored. And the very lower level of this water reservoir is 49 meters under the ground. This 49 meters deep. People to make this water reservoir, they had to dig uh, the ground down. Like they had to evacuate a massive load of the rock and soil to make a container ready for the water. So I will show more of this structure to you, but you can see there are some uh, places. So in the older times, uh, sometimes like in the spring, the water levels would be higher. In lots of the water reservoirs, people could have collected the water from the higher levels if they wanted. Uh, they always had the option to come to the very lower level if they were strong to like, carry back all the water. But if you could have collected the water from the lower level, the good thing was that uh, the water would have been much cooler. You can see the reservoir from another angle. And you can see the way down to the bottom of the water reservoir. Yeah. So it's like 23 meters down. So imagine in the older days, people need to come here a few times per day to carry the water, like the bottles and containers, fill up the containers and get back to the top. So now I explain a simple thing. Now I want to ask a question to test your technical thinking or your imagination. And don't worry if you don't get to answer. That's okay, that's all good. Uh, you can see that sometimes we had to store the water for quite a long time. But if you collect the water quite a long time, it's gonna be rotten. It won't be usable. So my question is, what was the trick? how people could have had the water fresh all year round, or at least to protect it from being rotten. Like if you have water for a few days, it's gonna be a smelly and it's not really drinkable. Wow. So it, it happened that people were sto stored the water in a container for six months, still it was drinkable. What was the trick? So should we give people a few minutes so people can type their answers? If you want to have yes. a go, uh, how I did... will share the screen again. Uh, <laughs> you oh, kind of okay. can see the answer, part of the answer in the screen. So Albert, might, Albert, might know, Albert might know the answer. I might have told Albert. So Albert, please don't share that if you uh, know. Mixed with vinegar keep it in the airtight containers, the air catchers, keep it moving. These are a few answers. I don't know. Yeah. It's, a, it's a tough one. So maybe I'll give it one more minute. <laughs> yeah. And also there are a couple of questions actually in the chat box. Maybe we can yeah. address it whenever yeah. you wish. We, yeah. Maybe in the meantime, when people are asking if you can read the question for me. Yeah, so we got the question saying, uh, somebody said, I didn't get if the pressured air went through cool water or only in a room cooled by the water. I think I answered that question. Okay, the next question is, so uh, there are ducts and waterways throughout the house to 
to carry the water? I didn't, uh, I didn't get that question. Mm. So are there waterways throughout the house to to transport the water when you show that? I, I mean, they cannot. Uh, for some houses, yes. Uh, it depends on if you make your house on the way of the canots, but not all the houses in a city were on the way of the canots. So some people had to come to uh, water reservoirs to collect the water. So the water reservoirs, most of the time, they've been in, in the direction of the water channels mm. and some of the houses. But it wasn't possible to build all the houses on the way of the water channels as well. Mm. So... Lincoln asked, do the towers displayed serve the same purpose as the one mentioned before? I, I didn't really get that question. Well. Okay, okay. I, uh, wh where was that question? Uh, I, so it's the question from Lincoln. Maybe I can spotlight Lincoln. Link, I don't know. Hey. Yeah. Yes, hey, I'm. I believe uh, Mr. Bauman has answered my question already. Since it is a wind collector, I'm. Uh, when before you explained it, I am asking for aff uh, affirmation if the towers are for wind collecting, which I'm sure you have already confirmed. Okay, great. So you guys are like, I had this presentation a uh, few times and I should say you guys are pretty smart. So the answers were like pretty good, accurate. Yeah, moon for uh, the total uh, length of the canals in Iran is around 400,000 kilometers, Lillian. Thanks for that. Yeah, that's correct. So yeah, one of the answers in the wind catchers, what wind catchers do, and we have few wind catchers to vent to vent the air. So the reason that there are wind catchers for a water reservoir is to make the water moving. See. So yeah. that's one of the ways to make the water fresh. The wind catchers has another purpose as well. They evacuate the moisture in the uh, water reservoir so the buildings can last longer. But it was another trick and it was, I had some uh, close ideas. It was mixing some salt with the water, but not the powder salt. You know, like there are some salt rocks. If you put some salt rocks in the water, the salt will solve really slowly. So we always have enough salt the water to maintain the water, not to get rotten, but it won't be salty. So it will be drinkable. So by the help of these two tricks, people would have made the water drinkable. But now I want to go one step uh, further. Let's see it's summer and it's hot. And if you feel like having some ice, nowadays we have freezer. We just go and open the fridge and we collect the ice. But imagine that you live in ancient Persia and there is no electricity, there is no refrigerator. What should have you done if you, if you feel like having some ice? So what I want to show it to you now is the traditional uh, ice boxes or ice houses. Oh, wow. So the idea is not really that different with... Uh, Water reservoirs or urban bar is using the same technical basics, but uh, for another purpose. So what you can see here is a traditional ice box. We can describe them as the collective traditional freezes. It's not that different with uh, urban bars. But if I go to details, you can see that uh, there are some differences. First, uh, there is no wind catcher. Secondly, the dome, the top of the ice box is not as big as Obama. And all of them as a technical reason. So let me take you inside the box uh, ice house. So one of the things that happened in Peja 
we have really hot summers, but in most places we have freezing winters in the same time. So if we can manage, if we can collect the ice in the winter and we can find a way for the ice not to get melted until the summer and over the summer, we can have ice in the summer as well. So what you can see is inside the ice house. None of them are using nowadays because we have freezing electricity. But what happened like uh, these ice houses, like the material are really, really good in terms of insulation. And like the walls and everything is super thick. So over the time, people managed to find some materials that has some good insulation uh, quality and after that but making the walls really thick they could have created a whole great insulation so what happens over the winter they make a really big container down and over the winter little by little they will fill up the whole thing out of the ice and then the whole building has a really good insulation yes yes so when we have the whole uh think uh, uh, like full of ice inside the dome the temperature will be really really low and because the whole structure is uh, like really good insulated it can it doesn't let the heat get in and uh, so in the summertime even in the middle of the desert you could have had the fancy of having ice houses. Ice, in, if you wanted to have like a really cold water or a drink, like really cold drink, you do all what you have to do, just go to the ice house and collect some ice. So these are all some examples of how people used to make the place livable. And the basic thinking based on creating a uh, balance between the four elements. Uh, I think we, I haven't shown you any place that people uh, use the fire just yet. So can anyone guess where people were using fire okay. as an engineering thing? Another quiz question for everybody to try type in the chat box. How did Asian Persians use fire? What did they use it for? Uh, if you want to have a guess, feel free to type. Just think uh, about our modern time, where we do need uh, wa warm water. Brick fur furnace, uh, blacksmith, brick construction, cooking and heating, BBQ, fire for cooking. <laughs> Good. What about if you want to wash ourselves? Mm, oh, yeah, hot, spring. hot springs, hot springs, hot shower. Yeah, so the hammams, you might find the same thing in Turkey or some Arabic countries. They are the great example of uh, insulation and making the balance between different elements. So let me show, take you to a traditional hammam. And this traditional hammam is in Shiraz, which is in the southern part of the country. Uh, what happened in the older days, people used to make hammams again right under the ground. Here you can see one of the old traditional hammams in Iran. So first of all, a hammam or bath place need to be warm by making it under the ground level. You could have make sure that in the winter time, it will be less temperature going out and in the summertime it would be in the summertime it would be less uh, heat coming so another trick for hammams was how to make the water clean so for this reason like I showed you how canals were working but uh, it wasn't like that. The canals just transfer the water easily. The canals, when they get to a place, the first place that people could have take, uh, 
uh, water was for hammams to have the clean water for washing. And as you know, to warm the water, we need to have some fuel. So the Persian hammams first, they were under different parts, under the ground. And people to wash themselves, they had to go to a container of the water. Something similar to this that you can see. So we didn't have like the shower like nowadays. It was like a pool of the uh, hot water that people like they were changing that pool. And over the time, they could have had some uh, like they could have washed themselves. So to warm the water, like the place to warm up the water was right under this pool. So people make the fire right under this to warm the water. And the building was very well insulated, but it wasn't only that. When we, when we make the fire, we have some smoke, which is really hot as well. So the smokes to be able to get out of hammams, they should have gone out through the tunnels that we've been moving all around hammams. So before the smoke can get out, they should have moved from the pipes and the docks all around hammams to give the heat to the building and to the environment of Hama. So in this way, no heat could have been wasted. People were using 100% of the heat. Uh, so the amount of the uh, fuel that been used for hammams, like it was incredibly low. And it was a balance of the fire and water. So with this getting technical, uh, that I explained to you. Uh, we are almost uh, at the end. I usually finish my engineering talk in Persepolis, which is really important technical place from the ancient point of view and for, do some other ancient attractions. But in this part, if you have any question, please ask. We have like three, four minutes if you have any questions. Uh, uh, Lincoln asked a question about clay, mm, ancient hot tubs. Uh, how do you spell hot bath hammams? Oh, yeah, it's. Uh, wow, you got a lot of quite yeah. a few questions. Yeah, the technical knowledge used to be passed down uh, mainly from apprentices. But uh, it's been the times that in ancient Persia that uh, we used to have like the biggest schools with technical knowledge. Uh, one of the popular sciences in the, from the ancient times, both in Babylon and Persia, was astronomy. And astronomy is something that need calculation. So for this reason, in Persia, we, we had some people who been really good at mathematics and they developed the techniques over the time. For example, none of the cannot masters, they didn't have mathematical knowledge, but the knowledge been developed with some mathematician and after that it were transferred through apprenticeship. But it, lots of them, they've been started based on a technical calculation. Is there any other question? Mm. So, I have a question for you yeah, yeah. about this talk. How did you come up with the idea and how did you do your research? It's maybe because I am an engineer or <laughs> it's like I was thinking of a theme of how all these things, like when I was a kid, I used to go to a hammam. Okay. Exactly the sa same as all that I showed you. And I want to make it a bit funny. I used to go with my mom and I was super shy <laughs> to go to a weird female hammam. <laughs> so I don't want to dig any further. I don't want to share any more details. But yeah, it was like something that we were living. And yeah, I was thinking that, thinking from a technical point of view, you always need to think different aspects, how all these things were working. Yeah. And so, why I did become an engineer? Maybe I, <laughs> because I went to Hama with my mom. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> that must be a very important Hama. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and also Sue from Sue has a very interesting question. Um, 
many of us think of Asian Romans being at the forefront of hydro technology, but listening to your talk, uh, do you think they actually Romans took their technology from Asian Persians? Uh, in the older times, people were exchanging lots of knowledge, but it seems that uh, like when it comes to hydrology, Persians used to be the best. And the reason of that is, the necessity is the mother or the father of invention. Sorry, my English, I, I mix up that. <laughs> this saying in English. But I think because the patients, they have to be really good at hydrology knowledge to make the land livable. Whereas Roman Empire, it used to be in Europe mainly. They, they've been in Africa as well, but let's say they've been in Tunisia, which is not really that dry. So yeah, the Romans had that hydraulic knowledge, but it seems that Persia, like they've been like a really, really high level of hydro hydro hydrology. So is there any question that I missed? Yeah, dispersion truly breeds innovation. So if you had spent as one single summer in 45 degree, after that you think how you can have water and how, <laughs> how you can have ice. And after that in winter, it drops to minus 20 degree, you know, so that how I can make a balance. And imagine that you live in such a place for generations. Wow. So uh, I want to take it to Persepolis. Persepolis is a huge place. Uh, you can talk it about whole lots of different aspects. I won't tour you much. I just show uh, some frameworks and I will share some quick technical thing. And after that, because I don't want to uh, take lots of time, after that I will uh, share a few other things before we finish this talk, if, if people have any questions. So Persepolis is pretty much the most important uh, ancient site of Iran. If you have read that Greeks, uh, Persian war stories, it's the place that Alexander threw a big fire when they got here. So it's a complex of the palaces. This is what has left behind uh, in the higher level. But I should say, if you want to have a look at Persepolis from a technical point of view, it will be like an encyclopedia of uh, engineering of the ancient times. So this place has been built uh, 2,500 years ago. And on that time, Persia used to be the biggest and the strongest country in the world, maybe something similar to the US nowadays. Like it was like the center of technology, power, and whoever has like the best skill in the world, either from Egypt or Greece or India or lots of places, they used to go to Persepolis, to this place, because it was like the most important project in a big ancient empire to offer the art. So that's why it is like an encyclopedia of the engineering on those days. So there are lots of rocks all around, like there are some columns and like the columns can be up to 110 kilo, kilo tons. So what makes the uh, Persepolis interesting in terms of uh, engineering knowledge and project management knowledge. Because in ancient Egypt, we have pyramids, which are like huge. But the thing is pyramids are the result of the work of thousands and sometimes millions of the slaves. Mm. And in ancient Persia, we didn't have a slaves as a working power. So it was, we need, we, people needed to be more calculative on how they want to build the place. Another factor that makes construction of Persepolis really challenging was again water. In ancient Egypt, you have Nile River. In Persepolis, there is no water. So lots of the heavy rocks in Egypt has been carried to the sites by Nile River. They were floating the rocks. But how people did that in Persepolis. So that's why it is a really interesting engineering site. So the whole site is around 180 acres and it is on top of a deck, a rocky deck. And the Persepolis has an underground, like a water supply system and a drainage system. So the ancient canals used to take water, but it used to be a dam 
sump were 40 kilometers up upstream that they hold the water and after that they make a tunnel they made a channel over the surface and that channel were flowing from the place that they could have collected the rocks and after that from the channel they float the rocks into the site just some examples but the water the the canals used to take the water and they used to have water purification system and the water purification system is the same system as what we see in Chogazambil, the ancient site that I showed it to you. So it was some people from Ilamat that made that water purification system. And the rock system, they've been mainly the uh, Egyptian and Greeks who were doing that. So it was like managing the art of people from around the world to build such a big thing with the less uh, effort. I, won't go further in that, just two more things that Persepolis has an ancient drainage system. And few years ago, we had a big flood in the plains of Persepolis. And we were desperate, we thought that Persepolis is gone. But what happened? This ancient drainage system drained the whole flood. And the last thing that I want to share with you is about the way some of those heavy columns has been built. So in Persepolis, we had some really interesting examples of uh, the modern crane. So the compound, uh, using the compound uh, rower technique. So some of the, like, those columns that you saw in Persepolis can be 180 tons. But uh, from what we had found in Persepolis, like these are the old uh, things that we found in Persepolis from the ancient workshops. So what it seems that people will know how to make a compound uh, a structure like this to put the rocks on top of each other with the minimum uh, labor work. So it seems that based on the calculation that we had nowadays, people by using only 18 people, but only 18 labors, they could have load the rocks on top of each other to build the columns. So like here you can see one, two, three, four, there are like a four different uh, compound rows. So if I want to tell you what will be the result of the uh, calculation, because of the compound effect, by only every person have 50 kilograms of power, which is like an average power of a like a labor, they could have load the rocks on top of each other. So it's pretty amazing. and. If that wanted to happen in ancient Egypt, they probably were using hundreds of labors. And the interesting thing, this is not, this wasn't the invention of the patients. That was the invention of, of Babylon and Elamites. So it was another aspect of the engineering in ancient Persia to learn uh, from the other uh, civilization and adopt those technologies in the harsh uh, situation. Uh, the last uh, two things that I want to share with you before going to that question and don't uh, make you more tired of uh, my talking. Uh, I'm a tour guide. I can talk for hours if no one stops me. So. I want to take you to Shushtar, not far from Chogazambil, to show you another great example of uh, engineering. So what I showed you in hammams and urban wars are the technologies that we use nowadays. Uh, Persepolis and this place is like an ancient site. So here you can see a collection of the water mills. Here is a big river in the place that we have uh, 
uh, lots of water in southwestern part of Iran. And it is the whole complex from the top. So what you can see at the back of stage is a dam. Actually, uh, this part of Iran, who's the start, the southwest that I showed in the beginning, has water and has lots of fertile land. Because of that, since the ancient time, it used to be lots of agriculture here. But when you have wheat, to be able to use the wheat, we need to make flour, to make bread. So how we can have the balance, how we can, the easiest way to make the flour using the water. So what you can see here is a hydraulic complex. This dam increased the water level to create some energy. And all around these rocks that you can see, there are lots of tunnels. And these little buildings all around, there are the water mills. So when the water level increase, and this is a 2,200 years old site, the water mills, they start flowing by the force of the water in the tunnels. And after that, they moving the uh, milled uh, rocks and we can have flour easily just by the force of the water. Ooh, wow. And, and this we're working for hundreds of years. And it's just one example of using the hydraulic technology to make the food without spending that much energy for the manpower. Mm -hmm. So now I have a question again. What happened for the rest of the country that they didn't have water? Here was the only exception that patients has water. How, how people could have made the flour out of a wheat? And well, again, um, we, 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 we like to have the thing simple. So. Wheat mills, wheat mills, wheat mills. Yeah, that's one answer. Can anyone guess? You can have the answer. Donkey, donkey mills. Cannots. Cannots has the flow of the water. So one of the, in the dry areas, people used to make the water mills in, in line with cannots. Mm. So the flow of the water, the certain areas, they make the water more like the steep. So the cannots could have rotated the water mills. Wow, so clever. But so yeah, clever. we had we had wind uh, mill technology as well. And I will finish my talk with an example of these uh, traditional wind mills. So in the very border part of Iran and Afghanistan, uh, we have really strong winds for around five months per year. So it's like really annoying. If you go to that place for five months per year, from almost end of the summer, it's like the wind make you crazy. But here is the place that people were using the wind mills, the traditional wind mills, that they're really interesting, kind of very different what we can find in Netherlands. So here is one of the sites in the border of Iran and Afghanistan, in inside Iran. And here you can see some examples of the traditional Iranian windmills. So like the direction of the rotators are different with what you see in Netherlands. Here you can see them from the top. It faces up. So I assume the wind blows from above or beside. This is your answer. So what happened? Can you see when the wind blows? Like, it's like there are some walls and there is a like narrow edge that wind can blow in. So what these walls do, they channelize the wind to go to the blade and rotate the whole thing. And after that, These blades will rotate this big stem, and this stem will rotate the rock. And we, again, we can get the flour out of the wheat. So that was my one hour of talk about uh, engineering ash and pasia. I can see uh, some comments. So I hope you have enjoyed this talk with the theme of 
engineering in ancient Persia, which was all about uh, making balance in different elements. Like these windmills were wind and uh, soil, like the water mills were water and soil. Again, it was the way of thinking of people. People were thinking around the four elements. This is really fascinating uh, due to the time constraints. We only have one hour. Otherwise, uh, we would love you to talk for hours and hours and hours. So, Bachman, uh, Bachman, Bachman, do you have yeah. other uh, related experiences online? If people are interested in other aspects of Persian culture, Iranian culture, um, what else do you offer? Okay, so what I do, I uh, offer virtual tours of Iran. So I have 12 different virtual tours. The most popular one is the virtual tour of Persia that I will take you to highlights of the ancient Persia. And it has a glimpse of the modern Iranian society. Uh, I usually do that nowadays every Sunday at 8 p.m. because I have an engineering full-time contract at the moment. Okay. So yeah, before I used to do that much more. And yeah, I have uh, other tours of like, let's say, one hour tour of Yazd, one hour tour of Isfahan, which is the capital of art and architecture, one hour tour of Shiraz. Apart from that, every month I have a free live with a theme. So this engineering ancient Persia were topic of one of my lives. Uh, next week I have a live about Persian carpet. Fantastic. So uh, and putting in your chat to... box, um, yeah. your website and your Facebook yeah, group. Yeah. You have a Facebook group. So I'm putting the links in the chat box. Yeah. People can check out if we want to follow on to and explore more. Yeah, yeah. So my free lives usually get very busy. Uh, I usually do the lives in the same time on Facebook page as well. So for my Facebook page, you can see the uh, Facebook, the events on Facebook. And I post the Zoom links, but sometimes people cannot get into the Zoom room because it's like 100 people uh, maximum uh, thing. But you can watch the lives from uh, the Facebook page as well. Uh, three weeks ago, I had a live about Persian gardens around the world. Before that, it was like this engineering talk. And before that, it used to be uh, Noru's or Persian New Year around the world how it's celebrated around the world. So yeah, every month we have, uh, thank you, every month we have uh, free lives and feel free, like my virtual tools are like very much, much more polished of these uh, free live talking. Like this was something to, to have a cultural talk about around this theme. They are not like a super polished experiences, but if you come to those like virtual tour of page, you are like, uh, they are much more polished and it's been work on that more. Also, it's, I start work doing the visual tours of Uzbekistan, which will be the main focus on the Silk Road. Oh. So there are two cities in Uzbekistan, Samarkand and Bukhara that used to be the richest cities of the world for four centuries. We were... So that will, be, that will be the future tour that I will start from next week. So feel free to join to any of my tours. This is incredible and amazing. Today is really eye-opening and mind-opening. We, we can't wait to experience more talks and tours organized by you. Uh, we are so thankful and uh, people wish you the best, uh, wish you uh, best career. Um, so I also want to, I want to thank uh, Bachman for staying up until midnight Australian time to give us the talk. Um, this is really a very generous effort you put forward to share with us. I'd like to thank Albert in the group. Uh, Albert is a fan of your cultural quest. He's also a fan of this extra culture community. He's the one who made the connection between us and you. Uh, have a very nice evening. We will see you more often in the future, hopefully. And next week, we have a Pacific time friendly session. Most of us like tea or coffee. So we invited two tea masters, uh, one Japanese tea master and one Chinese tea master. They inherited the trades and the profession from their family. 
they will give us a demonstration of how the art of serving tea then discuss from a cross cultural perspective. Afterwards, um, for people who are interested in join, please bring a teaware or some tea traditions etiquette from your culture so you can share with us as well. It will be coming Sunday, 5 p.m. British summer time, which is 4 p.m. GMT. So thank you very much, everyone. Perf fantastic talk here today. We enjoyed it so much. Very interesting and see you next week. Okay, thanks everyone. Uh, please don't forget if you like to write me a review as well. And yeah, looking forward to seeing you on the lives and take care everyone. Uh, should we write reviews for your Facebook group, in your Facebook group? No, no, in Google, if it's okay. Oh, okay. So do you want to share the Google yeah. link? Yes, just a okay. sec. Yeah. If you can put in the chat box the Google link, uh, some of us will stay and make sure we are able to give you a fantastic review for your fantastic talk. This is really interesting angle. Thank you. Just a sec. I can share that with you guys. Oops. There you go. Sorry, like I uh, just copied literally from the uh, website. Like usually you need to provide a link just to click on that, but it's no spam. Just click on that and it will take you to the review page. Great. Okay. Th thank you, everyone. Uh, you can message me on my Facebook on the uh, Facebook page as well if you have any questions. And yeah, I wish you the very best and take care of yourselves and enjoy the rest of your Sunday. For me, it's Monday. <laughs> okay. So happy Monday and uh, everybody else, happy Sunday. Bye. Okay. Take care and bye.